Good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are, and uh, welcome to Renaissance Lives, dedicated today to the painter, Peter Paul Rubens, who is Alexander Marr, who is Professor of the History of Early Modern Art at the University of Cambridge, and is the author of the book we're discussing today, Rubens' Spirit from Ingenuity to Genius. You can see, obviously, the cover and the table of content. To give you a very brief introduction of Peter Paul Rubens, 1577-1640, is a very much a Baroque painter who saw himself as a Renaissance man. On the one hand, he absorbed the fluidity and the elegance of Italian painting, as well as the classical models, which had been distilled by Italian painters of the 16th century. But he also inherited the taste for the tangible and the physical, which is so characteristic of Flemish painting and artistic traditions. So the breadth of his work truly connects with the multifaceted meaning of the concept of, uh, of spirit, now, it might seem perhaps a little paradoxical to speak of spirit with this most corporeal, if not fleshy, of all painters, but uh, quite the opposite, because as it is well known, one of the best ways to approach incorporeal things, such as mind or spirit, is to look at their material manifestation, at the material things that they animate. And uh, this is exactly what we're going to do today, looking at the various spirits which are contained and active and have activated the painting of Rubens. And for this purpose, I'm indeed very privileged to be joined by Christine Gertler from the University of Bern, a friend of many years who was also a fellow at the Warburg Institute some years ago, who has written extensively on Rubens, on Antwerp artistic tradition, on things on scenes such as the spirits and senses, as well as on early modern matter, matters and materiality. So without further ado, maybe you'd like to begin the conversation, Christine. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Francois, and it's a true pleasure uh, to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And I would like uh, to begin by congratulating you, Alex, uh, to your book, which I very much enjoyed reading. It's difficult or it's not easy to write a book on Rubens that is different from other books and nonetheless captures an essential trait of this versatile artist. So I think it would be helpful if you could, at the beginning of our conversation, tell us a little bit more about your approach and your decision to use the concept of spirit as a keyword that guides uh, us or the readers through the four chapters of the book, which uh, treat Rubens' religious works, Antwerp's culture of ingenuity, Rubens' uses of antiquity, his visual feasts, and as a conclusion, his landscapes. Thanks very much, Christine. Well, um, maybe before we get into the conversation, can, can you hear me actually, by the way? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you can hear me, okay. Yeah, um, maybe before we get into the conversation proper, I could just say a few, a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you to you, Francois, for inviting me to, to write this book on, on Rubens and, um, and to the editorial team at, at Reaction, um, Michael, uh, Alex and Amy. Um, I think Renaissance Lives is an absolutely fantastic series. I've enjoyed reading a, a lot of the books that have already come out, and I know that there are many, many still, still to come. Um, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to uh, thank one of my students, Annika de Bont, who um, was my research assistant when I was researching and, and, and putting the, the book together. Um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank her and, and also Christine, you, of course, for being my, my interlocutor today. So the, the Renaissance Live series asks authors to approach their subjects from a particular angle. And so when I was thinking about, about what to do with Rubens, whose career is 
uh, vast, whose life is prodigiously complex. This was this was no easy task. But I'd been working on, on Antwerp and its artistic milieu for some years, and I'd also been uh, running a project, a collaborative project, on the culture of early modern ingenuity. This was a project called Genius Before Romanticism, and its motivating question was to ask, really, what, what was the prehistory of our, of our um, romantically determined modern notions of, of genius? And how did the early modern culture of ingenuity morph into that uh, more modern concept of, of genius. And, and during that work, I'd noticed that Rubens's name cropped up repeatedly in the critical literature and in the primary sources where he and his work were described using the, uh, the language of ingenuity, which um, itself is quite complex and varied, but, uh, but there are a couple of key terms that, that kept emerging in relation to Rubens. Genius itself, genius in, in Latin, ingenuity or ingenium, um, which in, in the vernacular um, in Italian is in ingenio, uh, in uh, Dutch it's haste, in English it's wit, um, but also spirit, spiritus in Latin, esprit in French, and again, haste, the, 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 same, the same word in, in Dutch. And so it struck me that this constellation of words and concepts would be a productive way of approaching Rubens and exploring his, his art. Um, it by no means allows one to, to cover everything because Rubens' output is so, is so large and, and diverse, but it at least gives a sort of clear thread um, with which to navigate his, his biography and his creative persona. But I also wanted to do one other thing with, with the book, and that was to think about the ways in which Rubens himself was used to fashion genius as a new critical concept, um, because in Rubens's reception, very shortly after his death by the French critic Roger de Peel, later on in the 18th century by Diderot, and then on, on uh, into the late 18th and early 19th century um, uh, in the writings of, of Goethe, Rubens is held up not just as an exemplary uh, pictor doctus, as an exemplary learned artist, but as somebody who exceeded the laws of nature to become something new, a, a universal genius. I, I think that phrase is used possibly for the first time by Roger de Peel when writing about, about Rubens. So I wanted to do two things, to, to look at how uh, Rubens uh, exemplifies this change from ingenuity to genius, and also how these three, three notions, spirit, ingenuity, and genius can be used to understand uh, his life and his work. Um. So uh, this might be a good opportunity though. So what we actually uh, see here, what I always find uh, very interesting, we see a work uh, for which uh, Rubens was uh, very much known as a painter of flesh, and which was at the time of its uh, origin, it was a very private uh, work. Uh, so it was a, an intimate and a personal painting. Very few people saw it. It was a tribute uh, to the beauty of his wife, as Elizabeth McGrath has uh, so beautifully um, argued. And the other painting, which was a religious uh, painting, was a very public, uh, very much discussed uh, painting. And we often uh, forget that Rubens, in fact, made his career through religious uh, paintings. And maybe, um, Alex, you could say a little bit more about uh, that, uh, particularly the detail, which is uh, now uh, shown on the screen. Um, how uh, did Rubens in his religious work engage uh, with the invisible and uh, spiritual work with spiritus? with the uh, sort of um, uh, supernatural uh, world. Uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, Francois, if you could zoom out for a moment, just so that we've got both images on the screen. Th uh, thanks. Yeah, so um, uh, 
when when thinking about writing a, a, a book on Rubens, I, I thought, well, what what is the what is the popular perception of Rubens? Um, and it you know when people think of him uh, and his art, they probably think of something like like the the three graces that we can see here on the left now in the the Prado, um, a late work from the 1630s, a monumental painting of a mythological subject, um, featuring ample nude women, and it's it's this body type that gives us the word Rubensian. So this is the sort of thing that, that Rubens is known for in the popular imagination as a, as a painter of flesh, and particularly a painter of female flesh. And we'll maybe have more to say on that later on in, in today's session. But that's uh, really not where Rubens started, started out. And, and in the book, I, I, I treat Rubens thematically, but also sort of semi-chronologically. So I wanted, I wanted to start with some of his, his early works, and in particular, his early successes in devotional or religious painting from his time in, in Italy. Um, and so I open with this, with this comparison or this contrast with the, the late Rubens as a painter of, of, of flesh, naked flesh, compared to the early Rubens as a, a, a painter of spirit, or, or um, perhaps it's more accurate to say of, of bodies being moved by the spirit. Because what we're seeing in the image on the right, which is his St. Gregory the Great with, with other saints, uh, a work of 1606 to 7, a work painted when Rubens was in Italy, because after his training in Antwerp, he, like, uh, like many artists, travelled to Italy to further his education. Uh, Italy was the, the centre of the, of the European art world at, at the time. And towards the end of his time in Italy, he was fortunate enough to secure one of the most prestigious um, commissions in Rome, which was the commission for the, the high altar of the Chiesa Nuova, otherwise known as Santa Maria in Vallicella. Um, now I need to give you a bit of background because it was called the Chiesa Nuova, the new church, because it had been refounded, rebuilt in the 1570s by the Oratorians, the, the religious order devoted to uh, St. Philip Neri. Uh, but the, this new church was built on the, on the site of a much, much older building. Um, a church had stood there since sixth century when St. Gregory the Great, who we see here, was, was Bishop of Rome. And I think that's what Rubens is probably alluding to in this sort of ruined architecture. I think this is a this is a reference to the to the ancient church, which is now being rebuilt and renewed within the context of the Counter Reformation. So this is very much a, a Counter Reformation altarpiece. Um, now, when the church was being rebuilt in the 1570s, um, two things happened. First of all, the workmen uncovered uh, an early Christian icon depicting the Madonna and child. Also, whilst they were rebuilding the church, they discovered that part of, of the roof basically wasn't supported. There was, there was no beam holding it up. So it really should have collapsed, killing the workmen, but it, it didn't. Um, this was considered miraculous and the miracle was attributed to the agency um, of, this, of this icon, uh, which was from there on after considered to be a miracle working uh, uh, icon and became one of the most precious relics of this church, the, the Chiesa Nuova. So this is, this is really the subject matter that Rubens is taking um, for this, this high altar, which was going to be in very good company. Um, already there had been um, paintings by Federico Barocci and Caravaggio. So this was, this was the young Rubens really trying to, to test his mettle. And he shows St. Gregory in the middle with his arms outstretched, surrounded by some other early Christian martyr saints um, gazing heavenwards whilst the dove of the Holy Spirit descends um, from, uh, from the heavens and brushes his forehead with its wing. Now, if we could just zoom, zoom out a moment, uh, Francois. Um, now, what we can see here is Rubens um, uh, playing cleverly with ideas of immaterial spirit and incarnated spirit and the way in which spiritual illumination can affect the faithful and how images, which operate by, via something immaterial, the, 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 sen the sense of sight, 
can actually move us um, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Because it's no accident that the, the miracle working icon, the Madonna of uh, Valicella, is illuminated by a ray of divine light. Rubens shows us that what we're seeing is something strange and miraculous, because you'll see that a, a puto on the right hand side is actually putting its elbow through, through the icon. And this is maybe sort of something metapictorial. He's showing that this maybe isn't the real icon, it's, a, it's an image of an image but he's starting to alert us to the fact that this is a painting that is, is uh, trying to tell us something about the relationship between the spiritual and the material. And there's a vertical axis that runs through the painting from this icon, the Madonna and, uh, and the Christ child with his blessing hand, down through the dove to St. Gregory. So the dove is the dove of the Holy Spirit. It's a, a sort of quasi-corporeal manifestation of divine grace. And what's interesting is that it's, it's, it's brushing the saint's forehead. And I think this is, this is really particular because in natural philosophy, medicine and theology, the, that part of the forehead was where the ingenium, was where ingenuity and intellect was thought to reside. It was also the place in which the animal spirits, so the, the most rarefied form of spirits that are concocted in the human body, sat. There are three different types of, of spirit in, in early modern medical theory. There are natural spirits which come from digestion. Those are then turned into vital spirits, a more uh, kind of refined form that course throughout the body and the arteries and, and enable things like movement and sensation. And then those rise even higher up into the brain uh, and they enable things like thinking, memory uh, and enlightenment. So what we're seeing here is Gregory's ingenium being inflamed via his animal spirits, which have been enlivened by the Holy Spirit, which descends almost in a shaft of light from this miracle working icon. Um, uh, light is another big theme, obviously, of this, of this picture. It's a very interesting exercise in chiaroscuro. And uh, I think we can be in no doubt that there's an added symbolic dimension. Um, uh, God is, of course, looks. He is pure light. Christ is uh, the lumen de lumine. He is the, the, the light of lights. And then, of course, we have we have natural light, which is uh, flooding the scene. So, again, that's something that is both immaterial and and material. And all of this is an opportunity for Rubens to uh, demonstrate um, how he can weave quite complex theological and natural philosophical ideas into a composition that is also highly legible. Uh, well, I'll, I'll come on to that in just a moment, because in this setting, it wasn't quite so legible, uh, highly legible, but also beautiful and an, an, an elegant arrangement of bodies in motion uh, and uh, 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 an, an elegant distribution of colours. And just just very quickly on this legibility aspect, um, this was was Rubens first attempt at the altarpiece. Unfortunately, when it was installed, uh, the way that the light hit it meant that um, you couldn't really make out the figures. There was some problem with, the, with, the, with reflections on the surface. So the commissioners, the oratorians, asked Rubens to paint a second version, uh, very different to this one. We don't have a slide, on, on, I think, unfortunately, um, uh, which is the one that's now installed. And, and this painting is now in, uh, in Grenoble. But this, this was Rubens' uh, first thought. I, I happen to think it's much more interesting and successful than the version that's, that's there now. So I think this is, um, thank you very much, um, Alex. And the uh, second version is actually illustrated in your uh, book. And we could also, now this is an opportunity uh, to move uh, from uh, St. Gregory's ingenuity or from St. Gregory's spiritus uh, to Antwerp's culture of ingenuity, you know, like this painting was moved uh, from uh, Rome uh, to Antwerp and uh, to a different uh, kind of audience or spectatorship, uh, uh, the gallery or the uh, Kunstkammer. 
a type of painting which was invented in Antwerp and will be actually see on the screen is uh, one of the most interesting elaborations of this new type. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Christine. So uh, w one of the things I was sort of keen to, to do in the book was to um, think critically about the what we might call the singularity model of genius. So the, the way in which we, we tend to, to think about genius, the way it's talked and written about, is really to do with individuals. Um, and this is, of course, sort of fitting for a series like uh, uh, Renaissance Lives, which is about the biographies of individuals. Um, uh, and, and Rubens himself promotes <laughs> promotes himself as a remarkable individual, as um, uh, uh, the, the premier painter in, in Antwerp, and indeed a, a heroic artist. He refers to himself quite often in his letters as, as somebody, somebody heroic. So he certainly has a, a conception of himself uh, as something approaching a, a genius figure. And yet, the reality was that his ingenuity, his genius was, was only um, possible because of his collaborations. Um, his collaborations with other masters in Antwerp, um, collaborations with his studio members. Uh, he had an enormous studio in Antwerp. And, and also his, his sort of social network, um, the, the patrons, the scholars, the princes, the diplomats, with whom Rubens engaged in Antwerp and beyond. Because of course it's important to remember that while he spent much of his career in Antwerp, he'd not only been in Italy, as we've seen, but he'd also uh, traveled extensively um, as a diplomat on behalf of the regents of the Southern Netherlands, Albert and Isabella. So I was keen to think about um, what that might mean for our understanding of, of Rubens and to think a little bit more about what we might call the distributed ingenuity of Antwerp and its art world. And there's, there's no better image really to, um, to think about that distributed ingenuity than, than this painting, which is not by Rubens, although it shows Rubens. Uh, we can see him, Francois, if you just zoom in for a moment, yeah, we can we can see we can see Rubens there. He's uh, in in a brown cloak, just behind the Archduke Albert. But this is a painting not by him, but by one of his Antwerpian uh, colleagues, Willem van Hacht, uh, painted in 1628, and it depicts the art gallery of the man that we can see on the right of this detail, Cornelis van der Geest who was one of uh, Antwerp's wealthiest men. He was a spice merchant, so he's very much at the heart of, in, of Antwerp as an international trading centre. Uh, he's a, an important art collector, um, an important patron of, of Rubens, and it shows him and um, uh, the rulers of the Southern Netherlands, uh, Rubens, and their many friends and colleagues in lively conversation about works of art. And all of this takes place under um, the, the banner of a particular motto, which um, we can see in the top right-hand corner over the entrance portal, Vive l'Esprit, which is the title of the second chapter of, of the book. So um, Vive l'Esprit, uh, can mean several things. Uh, it means long live ingenuity. So it's a celebration of Antwerp's ingenuity, but it's also a pun. Um, Van der Geest's surname means in French, esprit, spirit or, or wit. So this isn't only celebrating Antwerp's collective ingenuity, but also Van der Geest's singular uh, talent in bringing these individuals together. Um, his coat of arms with three doves is above the, the motto in a, in a cartouche, which is surmounted by a skull, a memento mori, reminding us that all worldly things perish, that even, even art will, uh, will one, one day decay. And above that, we have something that we've seen already uh, in Rubens, the dove of the Holy Spirit, which is sitting perched on top of the skull. And you'll notice that like in the St. Gregory the Great, 
it's in a direct vertical axis with Christ, because just, just above the, the dove, uh, there's a large painting of Christ in the house and of Mary and Martha, which is a work actually by one of Rubens's teachers, uh, Adam van Noort. And so the suggestion here, as we saw in the St. Gregory, is, is that haste and esprit, wit and spirit, the things that power artistic creativity, patronage and intelligence are ultimately God given gifts. Um, Alex, if I could just uh, jump in, it's also quite interesting uh, that this painting was uh, made in 1628 uh, when uh, Rubens was in fact at the height of his uh, career and was himself a very wealthy man, as you also um, just uh, mentioned. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, you explained now uh, the motto that all worldly things uh, perish. And could you say more about the theme or the topic of vanitas, which also seems uh, to be a little bit ambiguous, a kind of a contradiction, because the painting also celebrates uh, the beauty and the uh, knowledge and the various relationships among uh, paintings and objects. Yes, it, it's 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 it, that there is a lot of ambiguity. I think that's part of the point of of images like like this. And and what I would say is that um, a, a painting like this is is meant to be. Um, Sort of comparative and dialogical. It's it's meant to be about comparisons between different kinds of themes, different kinds of ideas, different kinds of paintings, different kinds of schools of painting. Of course, this is the period in which the notion of national schools of art is just starting to emerge, each with their own genius, each with their own uh, each with their own wit. In relation to vanitas, the, the motto vive l'esprit probably um, is a sort of a, a, a cropped translation of a famous Latin motto, vivitur ingenio ketera mortis errant. We, we live by wit or we live by the spirit, the rest belongs to death. So again, in, in this um, Catholic world of early modern Antwerp, that's I think a, a recognition that what, what ultimately matters regardless of mortal fame, regardless of, of worldly talent, uh, is, is the soul. And, uh, and that's why we can see in the, the bottom left hand foreground, van der Geest is pointing to one of his um, favoured paintings by Quentin Massais, the, one of the founders of the Antwerp School of Art, uh, a Madonna and Child, the so-called Madonna of the Cherries, uh, and also touching his, his heart, that this is something that affects, uh, affects, his, affects his soul. Rubens, we can see, is almost whispering into the ear of Archduke Albert as though he's an artistic advisor explaining the iconography, walking the Archduke and Duchess through this, this remarkable work. And if, if Quentin Massais was one of the founders of the Antwerp School, um, Rubens was seen to be both uh, someone who inherited his legacy and also exceeded it. He was known um, uh, in, his, in his lifetime as the Apelles of Flanders. And there are, are poems which compare his genius to that of the, the past painters of antiquity. And there's a great deal of, of, of um, local civic and national pride invested in Rubens as, uh, as somebody who could finally rival the glories of, of Italy. And yet having said that, the gallery itself is is uh, uh, stocked with works not just by Antwerpian artists, but also German artists. We have works by, by Dürer and Adam Elsheimer. Um, we have uh, works by Italians, uh, Raphael, uh, bronzes by Gian Bologna on the table. But there is something, something special, I think, about, about Rubens and Massais's relationship. Um, and if we, if, we, if we zoom out a moment, Francois, we can, we can see this. Um, in the relationship between two pictures. So I don't know how easy it is for you to, to see in the image, but uh, on the left-hand side, um, uh, about two thirds of the way, uh, sorry, on the right-hand side, about two thirds of the way up, there's a, a famous uh, painting by Quentin Massais of a scholar. And he seems as though he's just been interrupted. 
He's in the middle of reading a book, but he's taken off his glasses and he raises his hand in a gesture of surprise as he looks across the gallery to another painting on the opposite wall. Francois, if you scroll over, I think we can go and see that painting. And if we zoom in, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's another portrait just above that one, just above that painting. Yeah, there, there we go. It's, uh, it's, it's this work, um, which is, uh, seems to be Quentin Massais's portrait of the alchemist Paracelsus, a figure who was of great interest to Rubens and, uh, and uh, the Cognoscenti in early modern Antwerp. But, but here um, we have a little bit of a game because this isn't actually Massais's version, at least in my opinion, it's Rubens's copy of Massais's version. Um, and since this, of course, is, 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 is a copy of that copy, we find that the painting is playing all sorts of fun tricks on us about the nature of mimesis, of naturalism, of imitation, what is real and what is, what is fictive. And um, this little arrangement of pictures here also, I think, tells us something about how Rubens' creativity was understood, because Rubens' copy of Messias is flanked on one side, by a, a fruit harvest or a nymphs uh, gathering fruit for a cornucopia uh, in the manner of one of Rubens's colleagues, Hendrik van Baalen, with whom he collaborated. And on the other side, a Venus in the forge of Vulcan um, um, in the manner of one, another of Rubens's teachers, Otto van Veen. So I think the idea here is that Rubens as a superlative creative artist takes the fruits of nature and cunningly works them with his mechanical art to transform nature alchemically into something new. And indeed, beneath these three pictures, if we just scroll down a minute, we have, we have the fruits of that transformation in one of Rubens's most important paintings from um, his middle years, the Battle of the Amazons, a painting of around 1615, which um, was possibly given by Rubens to van der Geest as a thank you for his support. Van der Geest was the person who uh, supported Rubens' commission for the raising of the cross, one of the great paintings um, of his early return uh, to Antwerp from, from Italy. And, and this, is, this is a work which is also full of spirit, but not the kind of spirit that we saw in the Gregory the Great. This is instead the spirit of bodies in motion. Um, the kind of spirit which in early modern art theory was called furia. Furia is a notion, it translates roughly into, into fury, which could refer to the sort of Neoplatonic rapture of the, of the artist in the grip of the muses, but could also refer to the study of force and how force enables motion and complex composition. So this is Rubens painting Furia in a, in a furious manner with great liveliness of facture. And this is something that contemporaries and critics were uh, particularly interested in in Rubens. One of his earliest biographers, uh, Bellori, refers to Rubens's Furia del Penello, the fury of the brush, the, the swiftness and immediacy with which Rubens painted and which was, was part of his great appeal as an artist. So uh, just to build up on Rubens' interest in issues of transformation, transformation of nature, we could now move on to Rubens' interest in the, in the transformation of antiquity, uh, of uh, sculpture, and particularly to his uh, Bachic uh, themes, which uh, reflect uh, his engagement with the creative process and um, his preoccupation with his own ingenium. So the Munich Silenus also decorate or is the title illustration of uh, your book. So we could look at this uh, three elaborations in uh, Bachic uh, topics. Here an early uh, drawing which uh, engages also with the uh, eclogues. And then um, the Silenus and the Veilate uh, Bachus. 
Yes. So um, imitation is a huge theme in Rubens. It's absolutely critical for our understanding of him and his art. And it was important for me in the book to, 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 to think about it and, and to try to, to treat it. Um, and one of the ways that, um, that we can think about Rubens and imitation is, again, through this notion of spirits, um, both actual and metaphorical, because one of the metaphors that Rubens uses for uh, the process of artistic imitation in the little, um, the few notes that he wrote on this in his, in his so-called theoretical notebook or his pocketbook, um, which have come down to us with the title De Imitazioni Statuarum, on, on, the, on the imitation of, of, of sculptures. He says that the artist should drink in ancient art, ancient sculptures, thoroughly imbibing the spirit of antiquity, digesting it, and then transforming it into something new in paint with the result that a, a fresh original artifact emerges that no longer smells of the stone. So Rubens was interested in transforming ancient sources uh, into modern ancient sculptural sources into 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 modern paintings in a, a sort of a, a sort of lively and immediate way in which and this is something that's well known about theories of imitation in, in the period in which the source is is recognizable the source has to be significantly um, uh, recognizable but that the artist has managed to, to to transcend or move beyond the source material to, to make something new and original um, uh, and that's really what uh, what becomes emulation that that's one of the things that Rubens is engaged in with these with these Bacchic works that I think in in some very interesting ways thematize this idea of drinking in antiquity so this is antiquity as a, as a vital spirit that quickens the mind and art because uh, Bacchus, let, let's remember, um, is a god of inspiration as well as drunkenness, uh, as is uh, his tutor and companion, Silenus. So, so when, we, when we look at these works, we have to think of them not so much as admonishments uh, against, against intemperance and, and, and immoderate drinking. And we might talk in a moment, Christine, about, about Rubens and immoderation and, and the vices, but as, uh, as allegories of inspiration and uh, allegories of the, of the creative process itself. Um, I mean, Silenus is particularly an interesting example because he's also a half god or a god of uh, drunkenness but also a god of poetry and in fact of creative poetry of cosmology he sings about the creation of the world and also about an animated world and what does this figure of Silenus uh, mean for or yes what what does it mean for Rubens what kind of why was he so interested uh, and uh, in fact painted uh, several times um, these uh, Silenic uh, paintings? Um, it, well, it's very difficult to say uh, quite what Silenus meant for, 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 for Rubens, but um, I think part of the reason he's interested in him is because he's a figure of contradictions. Uh, and ambiguities. He's, he's, a, he's a figure who is famously ugly on the outside, but conceals mysteries within. This is the Silenus of the of, yeah, Alcibiades, of, uh, of, 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 of Socrates. So he's somebody with an ugly external form, but who is beautiful within. He's a drunk and somebody slothful. Um, we, we see him in the drawing in his, in his slothful state. Um, there he is asleep, having, having, having got himself drunk again. He's been, he's been bound by these sort of cheeky naiads and, uh, and the boys Chromis and Nasilos. He's being daubed with paint. And, and in order to be, to be released, he has to, he has to sing. And, and, and that's, that's when, as, as you say, Christine, Silenus sings these Orphic hymns, hymns about the origins of the world, about 
the divine spark about creation and creativity itself. So, so that's that's certainly one of the reasons that I think Rubens was interested in in this figure of Silenus because he he stood for that creative impulse. Um, uh, so, so these are works in which Rubens is both trying to conjure the ancient world, trying to inhabit properly and fully, in part through his study of ancient statuary, in part through his immersive reading in, in the classics, to really in, inhabit that world of the, of the classical myths, but also to, to reflect and perhaps channel his own creativity. And if we, if we look at the great Munich Silenus, this is a, a work from, um, from the, mid, the mid-teens, around 1615-16, with, with, with some, some later editions, there's, there's one, one really interesting feature for me, which I, I don't actually touch on in the book, but I thought I might try and, try and float, float here, which, um, which maybe connects to what we saw earlier in the Gallery of Cornelius van der Geest, because there in that Gallery of Cornelius van der Geest, you'll note, you may have noticed that the, the wings of the dove look as though they're, they're the wings of the skull, the wings of Ingenium, the wings that give uh, uplift intellectual enlightenment. There we go, yeah, uh, uh, th- there we are. Yeah, you can see that they're not actually the wings of the dove. Yeah, they're actually mantling the skull. Of course, wings feature on Hermes' helmet. Uh, they're symbols of eloquence. They're symbols of uplift. They are the 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 the, the symbol um, par excellence of Ingenium. And if we just zoom in to Silenus's head, Francois, thank you very much. You'll see that yes, he's he's crowned with 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 vine leaves, but uh, uh, he also seems to have a, a little sort of shadowy wing being formed by a parting in the clouds behind him. Now, I don't know whether others, others see this or whether it's a, a figment of my imagination and I'm seeing the wings of Ingenium everywhere, but, but certainly Silenus was, uh, was a figure who exemplified Ingenium um, for Rubens and his contemporaries. And I wonder whether he smuggled in one of the wings of Ingenium into this, into this picture. Certainly with the Silenus and even more so in the, the Bacchus on a barrel, if we could just go to that, that image for a moment, Francois. Uh, Rubens is, is interested in the, in the commonplace, in the adage, winum acuit ingenium, wine sharpens wit. Of course here we're, we're, you know, we're, we're not talking um, actually, but again, metaphorically. Uh, about about the the intellectual delights, the artistic, the creative, the natural delights that the that the artist needs to drink in in order to sharpen his intelligence, sharpen his creative prowess, and that I think is one of the things that that he's doing with with the Bacchus on uh, uh, on a barrel. I think uh, he's using this as a as a sort of celebration um, of uh, of that process, and it's a cyclical process. Uh, because oh, there we go. Uh, we have in, 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 in the bottom, the bottom right hand hand corner, a little puer mingens, a, a peeing boy expressing himself freely. The juices flow in, they flow out. We have another satyr child uh, um, who is, uh, is drinking wine that dribbles from Bacchus's tatsa. And, and let's not forget that, um, that this sort of alcoholic spirit uh, maybe stands also for Rubens's own painting materials. He paints, doesn't he, in in a spirit. He paints in 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 oil. <laughs> so, um, particularly when we now uh, look uh, looked at this uh, Puer Mingens and uh, the celebratory paintings, we can now move uh, to your last chapter, the last chapter of your book. Uh, on uh, festive uh, paintings and, in fact, um, paintings uh, that uh, treat uh, topics of fertility and abundance. And I don't know, uh, would you like to to start with this uh, famous um, uh, Het Pelschen? Yeah, so, well, um, in the final chapter, I, I, uh, I write about what I call genial painting. Um, and Ruben's approach to festal or festive and also procreative subject matter. So the, the Puer Mingens, which we saw in the, um, in the corner of the Bacchus on a, on a barrel, is um, uh, more than anything a, a, a figure of fertility. 
And so I was interested in this final chapter in exploring the ways in which in Ruben's life and art, we find an interweaving of these notions of spiritual creativity with um, corporeal um, uh, eroticism, uh, the relationship between a profane and sacred love, and the ways in which in Ruben's festive painting, as well as in his, his Bacchic works, he's exploring the connection between his own um, physical and sexual self and his creative and artistic self. Um, we certainly see this in the famous Het Pelsken, um, uh, a, or the, 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 little, the Little Fur, as it's colloquially known, um, which is a portrait of his second wife, Isabella Formal. Uh, this is a work painted in around 16, 1636, uh, 1630, 37. As I say, she was Rubens' second wife. He had married first in 1609, Isabella Brandt. Um, uh, and it's maybe just, just worth saying, although we don't have an, an image of her, that it was a very devoted marriage. And that when Rubens lost her, she, she died sadly, sadly young in the, 16, in the 1620s, he was absolutely grief stricken. We have this image of, of Rubens, in part cultivated by himself, but in, in part by, by posterity, that he was, uh, he, was a, he was a Stoic or a neo-Stoic, that he was someone always in command of his emotions. Um, he was somebody who was devoted to philosophy and to the mind, not to the body, that he's a, a follower of, of Justus Lipsius. And, and there's, there's some truth to all of that. But there's this amazing passage in, in one of his letters where he's writing about the loss of his, of his wife and how he's consumed by, by grief. And he says it, it makes him realize that, that, that he could never achieve that sort of peaceful spirit of, a, of, of an equanimous Stoic. He could never achieve that Stoic constancy. So Rubens is, is a man who, um, although he does attempt to temper them in certain respects, is a man of great, of great passions. He had a period in his, in his life um, of, uh, of being single, um, but later in life, uh, he, he married the much younger Elena Formon, who was in her teens, whereas he was a, a significantly older, older man. And um, partly, I think, because of this relationship, we, we find a remarkable rejuvenation of Rubens in his, in his, in his later years, um, including numerous explorations of the, the theme of profane love, in which uh, Helena herself uh, sometimes features. So, so, so here in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this painting, the, the Feast of Venus, painted around the same time as Het Pelskin from the late um, 16, 1630s, um, uh, which is a, a, a celebration of the goddess Venus by various different kinds of women of ancient Rome, um, matrons, um, uh, wives, um, sex workers, uh, all who have come to propitiate the goddess, to, to, to libate her, to offer her incense, uh, in, in part with the wives here that we see offering, offering dolls in the hope of begetting children. Um, so, so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, eros as procreative force within, within marriage. And, and that's one of the meanings of genius at the time, or at least of, of that which is genial. Um, so uh, the, the, the word genial means not only pleasant, merry and festive, but also procreative. The genial bed was the, was the marriage bed. It was where a marriage was consummated and it's where um, children are, are, are begot. And, and, and this is foremost in Ruben's mind in these late years. With his second wife, uh, they have um, more children. Uh, Rubens adored children. He adored his own children. And you can see this is a, this is a riot, really, of, of toddlers. Uh, they're little Amorini, the, the children of Venus. Um, in part here, this is again an exercise in, in, in imitation or emulation, because the painting is inspired in part by um, uh, Titian's treatment of a, of a similar theme, the worship of Venus from 1518, which Ruben certainly knew, or at least knew, knew in a copy. Um, it, it's a subject that comes up in Philostratus as, as well, and, and uh, Rubens has taken those sources, fused them, as, as Liz McGrath has, has shown, with 
um, his reading in, in Ovid, in the Fasti, in, in the feast days, to, to create a work which um, celebrates antiquity, takes us forcefully into the ancient world, but also anchors us in the present and in Rubens's biography. Because at the far left of the image, if we could move over there, Francois, amongst the nymphs and satyrs who are cavorting in front of a, of a grotto with its plashing stream, we have a portrait, the figure of the left, of Elena Formal, of Rubens's wife, in the embrace of a, of a lustful satyr. Um, it's very hard, I think, to escape the, the notion that there is a biographical element to this detail, to this painting as a whole. There's been much debate about, about the role of Helena in relation to Rubens's creativity, uh, um, her role as both a, a model and, uh, and, and, and a muse. Um, we could talk more, maybe we would in questions about, about, about Rubens and, and gender, um, the, uh, the gendering of genius which was very, very strong in the early modern period. There's absolutely no, no doubt that for most early modern theorists, uh, men were considered to be the superior uh, um, talent, the superior sex, in part because of their fiery heat. Again, a sort of furia, a, a heat that was necessary, by the way, for the begetting of children. So, um, so this is, yeah, this is, this is, this is late, this is late Rubens exploring, I think, via antiquity, via imitation and emulation, his sexual and his psychic self. And he also combines uh, the world of antiquity with uh, his own uh, world. And at that time, he had already uh, withdrawn from diplomatic uh, service and he spent more and more time in the countryside and we probably should at least in conclusion look at one of his landscapes where he actually is also the shows his interest in weather atmosphere the ingenuity of um in fact, also agriculture, uh, it's not uh, simply a landscape, it's a landscape where uh, certain works are being done, where there is hunting, where there is agriculture work, 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 and where we do have these uh, beautiful uh, skies uh, he shows. So, um, yes, uh, Rubens' senioral life, perhaps yeah. at the end, yeah. Yes, so, so, so Rubens, having been a busy diplomat, having, having been very much an urban figure living in the centre of Antwerp, having travelled across Europe to capital cities with his diplomatic labours, in, uh, in the 1630s he, he retires uh, more or less from public life, and in 1635, and he's, as you'd said earlier, Christine, he's a very wealthy man by this point, he's been made wealthy by his, by his industry, uh, by his, his studio, by his painting career, also in part by his diplomatic activities. Also maybe worth mentioning that, that Rubens is involved in the art trade, he's involved in buying and selling art. But in 1635, he purchases a country seat, the manor of Hetstein in the Brabant countryside, and he spends increasing amounts of time there. Um, it's a period of time towards the end of his life, the last five years of his life, in which his, his health is starting to fail. He'd always been an extraordinarily robust figure. And I think that's something that's important to note too, that the, the, the robustness of his painting was, was matched by his, his sort of physical health. This is something that, uh, that critics comment on in relation to his name, Rubens, the man of robustness and, and rubor, literally glowing with, 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 with redness, fire and, and, and life. But, uh, but he has gout. Um, possibly arthritis in his in his later years, and and he buys this this manner of of, of Hetstein, and he turns increasingly to landscape painting. Now, how does this connect to genius? You might be wondering. Well, uh, first, it connects to the idea of the of the genius Loki, the spirit of the place, something that Rubens knew well from his his readings in ancient authors such as Virgil and others, which inform his his late landscape 
work. Um, uh, but this is important also, I think, for, for, for Ruben's exploration of his identity in relation to, uh, to both nation and social standing. Um, first of all, because with the purchase of Hetstein came a noble title. Rubens became the Lord of Stein. He'd been born into a, 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 a respectable but not noble house. And so finally, through the fruits of his labors, he becomes noble. And that means that through his ingenuity, through his ingenium, his talent, he had become ingenuous. That is, he had become freeborn, noble, and also, of course, being ingenuous is to be frank, honest, trustworthy, all the hallmarks of a, of a good diplomat. So, so Rubens finally attains ingenuousness through his ingenuity. Uh, and, and he also seems to, to be interested in, in what locale means for him as, as, as a Fleming, as a, as, as a Flemish national. Um, because Rubens was well aware that landscape as an independent genre, which was fairly low down in the hierarchy of genres. You know, Rubens thought of himself as a history painter, someone who paints allegories and, and uh, mythological scenes and, and uh, um, biblical scenes. Um, uh, but he starts to be interested in this lowly genre landscape. And I, I think it's at least in part because he's exploring the, the recent history of Flemish painting as it had been developed by people like Peter Bruegel the Elder, whose, whose works he owned. And let's not forget that Rubens had started out his apprenticeship as a painter with a landscape artist, uh, Tobias Verhacht. So it's almost as though at the very end of his life, he's returning to his roots, exploring with this new um, social freedom and perhaps a new artistic freedom, what it means to have artistic identity in relation to a locale how the genius Loki, the, the genius of a place, can be connected to the genius of an individual. Yes, and in a way it becomes now full circle because um, again, it's a sort of an imitation, but also a transformation of an earlier Flemish uh, genre, which he in a way renewed uh, by his own very specific approach. And also, in a way, combined um, classical antiquity, uh, you know, uh, poetry, uh, with uh, his own um, imagination of the landscape. Yes, th that's right. I mean, uh, like almost everything he does, he transforms it. So um, Rubens's treatment of landscape is on the larger scale. It's uh, it's far broader. His handling is. It's very, very loose, it's certainly in relation to the, uh, the cabinet paintings um, of, of people like Tobias Verhacht um, that he, uh, that he had, had sort of started off with uh, as, a, uh, as, as a youth. Thank you, Alex. I think it, it's about time for me to uh, invite our audience to uh, ask their question. Uh, and by using the um, the raise hand button, if you if you care to raise your hand, and then you, you can ask questions to uh, our speakers. While uh, people are, are thinking of questions, as I was looking at this landscape, it still is so different from the landscape you would see in the Patinir or in Bosch, which tends to be very imaginary. While this, as you explain um, at the end of your book, it's really the representation of someone who owns the land rather than someone who imagines it. Yes, that, 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 that's, that's, that's very true. And, and yet I think we, we need to be a little bit cautious in um, describing Rubens as an exclusively naturalistic painter when he's treating landscape. Um, and, and here I might, I might bring in, in uh, Goethe. Um, this, that's sort of really where I, where I end the book uh, with Goethe's comments on Rubens as a landscape painter. Um, and he's not, he's not talking about this painting, the, the, the landscape with, with Hepstein, but, uh, but another, another painting in which um, uh, Rubens uses two different contradictory light sources, something that can't be found in nature. We know this because the shadows are cast in, in different directions. And this is something that critics had complained about it's not naturalistic in a landscape to have this. Why, why did Rubens do it? It's a flaw. Goethe says, no, no, this is Rubens's genius. 
He can take nature, but show that he is above it. So th this is really a, a sort of signal moment in Rubens' transformation into a romantic genius, that he's somebody who in Goethe's eyes is constrained neither by natural law nor divine law, but is entirely autonomous, entirely autonomous, entirely free. These ideas of romantic freedom are, of course, absolutely in, in, intrinsic to notions of romantic uh, uh, genius. Uh, and that's why I think it's very interesting that Rubens seems to be exploring in very different ways to the way that Goethe thought this idea of freedom in relation to ingenuousness uh, at this stage in his in his career. Uh, I have a question in the in the chat from Giacomo Prido, who writes, well, I'm in the library, so I can't speak out loud. but. <laughs> Do you think that it's virtue indeed? Do you think Rubens was specifically aware of Alberti's ideas of otium and leisure time in his landscape painting? Hello, Giacomo. It's very nice. This is one of my students. It's really lovely to, to, to have you here. Um, good question. Uh, we're pretty sure that Rubens had read Alberti. Um, it seems to me very likely that he was aware of ideas of otium and negotium, not only in Alberti, but also in, in, in figures like, uh, like Pliny and, and, and Cicero, where he also would have found these, these notions. So yes, I mean, Rubens, although he spends increasing amounts of time at, at, at Hedstein, he's also going backwards and forwards between here and Antwerp. And so it must have been in his mind, he's carrying on his business, maintaining his studio, this distinction between a life of leisure and a life of, of action, of, 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 of commerce on the one hand and the city and uh, uh, freedom and nobility, as it was construed then, uh, in the country. Well, if I, if I may ask one further question about this painting, how much was really in Antwerp? How much is a copy, for instance? When I look at the antique sculpture, I recognize the, well, some of which the originals are obviously in Rome. So how, yeah. much, is, how much is their cast? And um, how many of these paintings were really there? Or perhaps they were, or perhaps it's an imaginary painting of a half imaginary connect, connection. How does it connect between reality, copy, and uh, fantasy? A good question. I mean, I think um, most most of the pictures we, we can we can reasonably reliably um, locate in Antwerp. Some in Rubens's collection, some in Van der Heist's collection, some in some in other collections. So it's it, it's a fiction in that in that sense. In, in, in that these works weren't all in in this room. Certainly not in a big room like this at the same time. Nor were all these people here together uh, at the, at the same at the same time. It, it commemorates a, a visit of the Archdukes Albert and Isabella to Cornelius van der Geest's home in, in the teens, but this is painted much later. It's painted in 1628 and Albert had died in 1621. So there's a, a good bit of fiction for you, for you right, right away. The, the, the statues, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, they're most of, some of them very well known, obviously, um, sculptures that are in, in Rome. We know that there were plaster casts of some of them in Antwerp at the time. We've got the, from right to left, the Farnese Hercules, the Capitoline Muse, the Apollo Belvedere. There we've got something that is not an ancient sculpture, but it's our Bacchus on a barrel. Uh, so this is something that, that crops up in leaf heather circles. The figure of Bacchus on a barrel appears in, in the rhetoricians plays that were staged in Antwerp during Rubens' life, lifetime. So he's a, a classical figure, but, uh, but with a, a kind of more local significance. We've got a Venus and, and Cupid, which connects to uh, an ivory, a small ivory, made by Georg Petl, somebody, uh, an, an, a, a German sculptor who was in Antwerp for a time, someone who Christine has, has, been, has been working on. We've got, uh, we've got a series as, as well. So, um, so, so yeah, wh whether, whether these are actual plaster casts that Van der Geest owned or they're just evocations, um, all of them, by the way, we could spend hours talking about what their significance is and who they're looking at. Um, they, have, they have symbolic significance as, as well as simply evoking, evoking classical antiquity. Well, yeah, it, it seems like an iconographic program with Ceres, Venus, and Bacchus, and Apollo. And if you want the link between Apollo and Bacchus, it's in Ficino in the De Vita Triplici, where he explains that the fire of Bacchus will prepare you for the light of Apollo. And um, certainly, listening to you and reading about Rubens, I find that Rubens is someone where Apollo and Bacchus are brothers rather than enemy as they become with uh, Nietzsche in the 19th century. Uh, 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 yeah. 
temperance. Uh, absolutely. I think I think that's very, very, very true, Francois. And um, I mean, you're right that the Venus, the series and Bacchus, I mean, that's intentional. It relates to, again, the adage, sine cerere et bacco, friget Venus, without, without food and wine, i.e. without nourishment, Venus, that is love, grows cold. It's, uh, it's no accident, I think, also, that we've got um, Bacchus and Apollo. Uh, Bacchus, if you can see, is, is looking up at, at a bust on, on the lintel. So the busts there are, if we, if we scroll up, yeah, there we go. We've got uh, Nero and Seneca. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Opposite, surely. So exactly, and and indeed, you know, this this relates maybe to the pictures that are on either side of them. You know, Nero uh, famously fiddling while Rome burned, and we have a, a conflagration there of uh, of uh, I think it's a uh, Sodom, is it Sodom and Gomorrah, Christine. I think it. Uh, my memory is failing. I think that's I think that's right. Yeah, it's a Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. by Musta. Yeah, I've that's right. I've actually pointed out point out in your article in the Netherlands yeah. yearbook. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an image machine. This, uh, this, this, this painting in, in which, in which Rubens is one component. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? Uh, don't be, don't be shy. Uh, I think there was a question in the chat. I think. Uh, okay. There were a compliments in the in the chat. Um, Yes, well, from Barbara Rumer, I just want to thank you for this great talk. And we'd like to mention that Alexander's book, Rubens' Spirit, is gorgeous indeed and highly recommendable. <laughs> thank you. That's, that, that's, that's very kind. Yeah, well, the, the gorgeousness is all, all down to reaction. They've produced, they've produced beautiful, beautiful books. And uh, yeah, the series, Francois, it's a great, great credit to your genius. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And to you, Sue. Well, on this uh, really happy and friendly note, perhaps uh, it's time to uh, finish the session. And uh, thank you both very much for the generosity of your time, for some uh, quality time. And obviously, this will be uh, uploaded in about two or three weeks uh, uh, online. And uh, I, will, I will send you the, the link. So. Uh, Thank you very much, Christine, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for being there. And uh, maybe we'll see you in a month when we will discuss the work of uh, Isaac Newton. So thank you again, and, and good night, everyone.